Hi, welcome everyone to the Science of Sport virtual field trip. My name is Darren Heaton. I'm the executive director with Science of Sport. Uh, thank you all for joining. For those that are new to Science of Sport, we're a nonprofit organization that focuses on developing STEM curriculum and bringing math to science to life uh, through sports. And so throughout the summer, we have a number of different summer camps going on. And one of our goals is to expose as many youth to different opportunities throughout the country as possible. And today's virtual field trip, uh, we have Ray Doswell with the Negro League Museum. And uh, we are excited to be able to have him involved with this virtual field trip to uh, really be able to showcase uh, the, the facility, the museum, the beautiful history. Uh, and so I want to bring in Ray and uh, give him a chance to uh, introduce himself. How, how are you doing, Ray? I'm well and greetings from Kansas City in the heart of America. Uh, we're glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Not a lot of science in my presentation, but we can allude to some things uh, and happy to talk about some baseball history today. Awesome, Ray. Well, well tell us a little bit about uh, what you do and uh, the museum itself. Well, uh, my official title was Vice President of Curatorial uh, of Service. Vice President of Curatorial Services. And a curator at a museum takes care of all the stuff in the museum, uh, among other uh, duties. A lot of uh, uh, museums, like art museums, have curators that really write uh, up uh, descriptions of what you see on the walls. And I do some of that too. But because of uh, our small staff and work, I have to do some writing, but I also do some research and care of exhibits as well. Um, and so I have, I'm, I'm one person that has to do a lot of jobs that in other museums have people to do those jobs individually, but it's rewarding work. I get to also talk to lots of people. We get about 60,000 visitors, uh, well, 65,000 visitors annually uh, at the museum. And I get to go across country and I get to do programs like this to talk to the young people about what we do. That's great, Ray. And uh, you're in Kansas City. Uh, how long has the museum been there for? The museum was founded in 1990. Uh, I came on in 1995. Uh, so we've been here a little while, uh, but we've we've gone through a number of different changes from a very small office to a medium-sized uh, building space to a large 10,000 square foot facility. And there's hope of doing even some more expansion. And in my presentation, I'll be able to show pictures of where we are today. Awesome. Well, uh, again, we have a, a number of different students from uh, throughout the country. We want to welcome them all for joining, uh, specifically those within the MLB Urban Youth Academies uh, that we're running camps at right now in New Orleans and in Compton. So a big shout out for, for to all of them. And please feel free to utilize the chat feature and we would love to answer any of those questions uh, as we go throughout this uh, virtual field trip. Uh, but with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Ray, and uh, we will uh, look, look forward to hearing everything uh, about what you're going to present to the kids. Well, very good. Well, thank you for this opportunity. Um, we will uh, include uh, my uh, have a PowerPoint I want to show you with pictures of the museum and things like that. That's our logo here at the museum. You may have seen that if you uh, um, <clears throat> buy any Negro League apparel or things like that. That is our official museum logo and uh, represents the history uh, of the institution. So uh, here is uh, one of our exhibits we call the Field of Legends. This is actually the end of the museum, teasing you with the end of the story first, huh? Because when you walk in, you get to see the story. You get to see this part of the museum. Uh, there are life-size bronze sculptures here uh, on a mock baseball diamond. Uh, and the idea is that you go around the museum and you learn all the history, all right? And uh, on the perimeters, photographs, hundreds of photographs and artifacts related to the history. And then you earn the right to walk on the field among these statues. As many of these statues um, are modeled after important baseball players. Some of them are inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. But, and what's important about that is that a lot of people like to think of us as the Black Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, we're not a Hall of Fame uh, per se. 
We don't do inductions. We don't do special elections like that. Uh, one, because um, if you understand the history of the Negro Leagues, um, these leagues existed because of racism and segregation. We did not want a segregated Hall of Fame. So uh, the Hall of Fame has honored players since the 70s, and we want to continue to encourage them to do that. So um, that's important to us. But as you go around the museum, you'll see these players. Now, also, uh, when you come into the museum, uh, you're separated from this area by a chicken wire fence, um, which chicken wire was used behind an umpire to keep you from getting hit by a baseball if you're sitting in the stands. But it was also a device that was used to separate seating when there was segregated seating. If you know the, the uh, vocabulary word segregation, where folks were separated. Um, and so we hope that you have a greater appreciation for the history, seeing this cool space, but not being able to get there until the very end. And you've learned and earned the right to go out on the field. All right. So here's the interest to the museum, though. When you come into the building, we do share a space with the American Jazz Museum here in Kansas City. Um, and this atrium uh, separates the two museums. Uh, you buy a ticket, you walk through this mock baseball uh, stadium entrance, and then you come upon this chart and map, all right? The chart and map represent the names of the different teams, where they were located, and the map will show you where they were located. So on this chart, we have about um, 30 different communities, cities across the country, uh, and about six different leagues um, and over 70 teams. They all didn't exist at the same time. This is from a period of 1920 to 1955. Now, this is only part of that history. Uh, to be um, more specific, uh, we recognize actually about eight different leagues, leagues being groupings of teams who agree to play common opponents on a regular schedule. Uh, if you, you all play baseball or in the sports of any kind, you're probably a part of a league or your team is part of a league or grouping of teams and you know your schedule. Um, and uh, we recognize about eight different leagues between 1920 and 1960. And there were even leagues before 1920, and there were teams existing after 1960. If you know the, uh, the, the, the news that came out last winter with Major League Baseball elevating, as they said, Negro League statistics to Major League level, uh, and Negro League teams to Major League level, uh, they recognized seven of these leagues between 1920 and 1948. Uh, so not all the history, but some of the history is included in that decision. Uh, but as I noted, uh, 30 different communities uh, are part of this. And here are some of them um, on this map here. Um, in social studies class, you may have learned in Black History Month or something, you may have learned about a period in American history called the Great Migration. Um, what was that? So after the end of the Civil War and the Reconstruction period in the South, um, after slavery, many African Americans uh, up through the beginning of World War II, so several decades, were moving. Many African Americans were moving by the millions across the country to, to try to find better life for themselves. That included uh, trying to find new jobs, new places to live, trying to escape racism as best they could. Uh, of course, most of those jobs that were they had after slavery were working on farms in rural areas of the country. Um, and they moved from those rural areas to the urban areas, uh, even in the South from like rural Alabama into Birmingham. Um, and then out to the South altogether into many of these bigger cities in the Midwest and in the Northeast. So that included Kansas City and St. Louis and Detroit and New York City and Memphis and other places. And they built these neighborhoods where they could live uh, because there was still segregation in America. Um, these neighborhoods end up becoming popular neighborhoods in Kansas City. That's 18th and Vine. In Memphis, that's Bill Street. In Chicago, it's the south side of Chicago. Many African Americans settled in Harlem and New York, uh, and they built their own schools and their own businesses. Uh, and among those businesses were baseball teams. Now, it's important to note, too, a couple of things. One, white people are moving, too, from the farm to the cities. Uh, and the cities uh, have lots of big factories and different things and new jobs are coming. So they're moving away from being farmers to working in factories and things like that. And all these cities have that. And baseball is popular uh, because um, 
uh, these big green grass fields and everything in the big cities reminded people of living in the farm areas and being in the open spaces. And that was one of the reasons why baseball was very popular in many of these communities. And black people enjoy baseball just as much as anyone else. Now we're moving through the history. Uh, African-Americans have begun to play baseball uh, in the 1800s. Uh, there were even African-American players who played on all white teams in the late 1800s through the early 1900s. Uh, but by maybe 1901, 1904, um, those handful of black players were pushed out of the what would become the white major leagues. There was never a written rule that said that they couldn't play, just collusion that kept them from playing. Uh, what I mean by collusion is that the team leaders and owners just because of race issues did not want the black players uh, to play on these teams and some fans didn't want it either. So the black baseball players and team owners say, okay, we'll try to do our own thing and create our own teams. And the baseball team is a small business. Try to create our own baseball teams and um, make a go of it ourselves. But it was always difficult to put together that league structure different groupings of teams that could play together. And uh, when you have a league and a schedule, then it's easy to know when you were going to make money because you knew when games were going to be scheduled. Uh, that was difficult when you don't own your own baseball stadiums, uh, when you have to go to baseball games in other cities by train travel, which was slow. Uh, and you had to do that with segregated conditions where you weren't allowed sometimes to go and stay at certain restaurants, or eat at certain restaurants or stay at certain hotels. It made it much, much more difficult for them to kind of manage having a baseball team back then. It was like having a traveling circus without a league schedule uh, uh, in place. But things began to happen in and around 1920. And this was part of our museum focuses on that period. Remember, I talked about the Great Migration. You might see at the top of our exhibit here city names like Indianapolis and Chicago and Kansas City and St. Louis. These are all the places where African-Americans were moving to uh, and growing. The population continued to grow in those cities. And these are names of some of the baseball teams that began to grow in these places. With people moving to these cities, then you have fans and fans can buy tickets to go to baseball games because they have money because they're working in the factories and other parts of the industry there. Uh, and so that meant that you can have leagues and teams be successful. There's a big statue in the middle of my exhibit there. That is a, a very important man. His name is Andrew Foster, uh, better known as Rube Foster, born in Texas. Uh, he was a very good pitcher in his own right uh, early on. He was born in 1879. Uh, but as he grew up, he became a great pitcher uh, and then became a team manager and settled ultimately in Chicago and founded a team called the Chicago American Giants. Um, in addition uh, to that, he helped to lead some of the other Midwestern teams like the team in Dayton, Ohio and St. Louis and got those team owners together to form what will become the first successful league, the Negro National League, in February of 1920. Uh, and that meeting to do that happened here in Kansas City 101 years ago. So it's a very important time period. Uh, these black teams began to play baseball and did, had a good deal of success, especially in the 1920s and 30s. One of the innovations that they had was night baseball. Now, it's important to know that there were a lot of teams, black and white, trying to experiment with having lights at the baseball stadiums. Um, uh, and it was very important at this time because now we're in a period of 1929. If you know your history, something important happens in 1929. We have a, a crash of the stock market and uh, the so-called Great Depression happens after that, an economic downturn for the United States. Many people didn't have money to go to baseball games. Uh, and if they did, they were working during the day. So teams were developing playing baseball at night. Uh, you'll see on my screen there, uh, there is a, um, uh, uh, on this on this panel here, there's a, a, a truck with a lighting pole and system here, all right? That is what was developed by the Kansas City Monarchs. And the Monarchs could not only have lights, but they could travel with their lights across the country, all right? that made it very easy for them to go to games and have night baseball games. They're doing this five years before the white major league teams were doing it. And so it was a very innovative uh, thing to do. 
Now, the leagues uh, were affected by that Great Depression. Uh, there were uh, rival leagues that formed in the East Coast. The Negro National League was mostly Midwestern teams. But both leagues folded uh, for business reasons. But teams like the Monarchs kept going as an individual business. But the leagues did reform in and around 1933. All right. Uh, and uh, that was a period that in this exhibit we call the golden years. Was, we're starting to see a real highlight of the Negro Leagues from about 1933 through to about uh, 1945 or so. So this section talks about some of the important things that happened there. Should point out that that is a authentic Kansas City Monarchs uniform there. It's made of wool flannel. It's very heavy. Uh, it helped to wick the moisture off of the player, but it got it was very durable, but it was pretty hot and sweaty. And we have two of those. You can't see the other one on the other side. But that uniform is probably about 80 years old. Uh, and uh, we're fortunate to have it um, uh, here at the museum. So uh, among the many innovations that the Negro Leagues had were the All-Star Games. Uh, and they had all-star games in Chicago every year, starting in 1933. Uh, in, uh, and being in Chicago, the south side of Chicago, at Comiskey Park, they were able to play their all-star games in neighborhood in a neighborhood that supported a uh, black life. Because on the south side, even though it was a white baseball stadium for the White Sox, um, it was on the south side of Chicago near restaurants and other businesses like a barbershop. Like we have a mock barbershop in our museum. Um, and these things help and restaurants and hotels help support the black tourists who would come to town to watch baseball. And this is just part of one of the important businesses in the community for African-Americans. Uh, and here's a picture of uh, in our museum, a little bit you can see of uh, Kansas City, so to speak. Um, there's the old Lincoln building uh, on this uh, board, which is where the museum used to be. And there was a clothing store there. These are baseball turnstiles from old municipal stadium where the Kansas City Monarchs used to play here. Uh, and this is meant to give you a sense of what life was like in different communities. Um, uh, it was a very important opening day was very important. There were thousands of fans that would come out uh, in May, usually early May is when the Negro Leagues opened uh, and they have beauty contests, they have parades, marching bands and all kinds of things were happening. So, and this happened not just in Kansas City, but in many of the cities where there were baseball teams. And you can see here, this is a photo from the 1950s of uh, a Negro Leagues game. Black and white fans enjoyed these games. Um, and this is, happens to be the Indianapolis Clowns uh, with against the Kansas City Monarchs. And I believe this is in Kansas City uh, at the old municipal stadium. Thousands of fans there. It was a big turnout, especially for the opening games. Um, and, and black fans enjoyed watching the major league teams as well and usually could go and sit wherever they want, uh, but uh, especially in the north and in the east. Uh, but that wasn't always the case in the South. But lots of fans enjoyed these baseball games, and there were well over uh, three to 4,000 ballplayers over this history period as well, uh, traveling across the country. So an important period uh, that comes up in history, we're skipping up to World War II. Uh, and African Americans are fighting uh, for their country in World War II. Uh, uh, against the Nazis, if you've heard of them, and the Germans, and the fascists in Italy. And these are people who didn't want to give everyone certain rights. But of course, African Americans didn't have certain rights back home. But they did join the United States Army, which was trying to protect the European countries especially. Uh, and uh, they fought valiantly. But the irony of not being able to have certain rights at home was not lost on many in the newspapers and the press, including those who followed baseball. This is the player on the cover here with the baseball. His name is Ernest Carter. Nickname was Spoon Carter. Uh, he played for a team called the Grays, Washington Homestead Grays. Now, there's the Homestead Grays were part of Pittsburgh at one point, but they moved their games to Washington, D.C. Uh, again, large black community surrounding the baseball park that they rented from a, a white baseball team called the Washington Senators. And they were very good, perhaps one of the best teams in baseball history during the period of the war. Now, during the war, um, they had something called a draft. And uh, when you were a young person, you were drafted into the military. You had to serve into the military. And, that, and baseball players were not immune to that. 
and white and black baseball players were drafted to the military. Uh, so it affected both the white major leagues and the Negro leagues, but less so in the Negro leagues where some of the star players were able to stay behind uh, because they were either too old or ineligible to fight uh, in the military. Um, so you could be a white baseball fan and go to games in Washington and watch the Grays and see some really, really talented players. In fact, there's a period in the late 30s through the early 40s where the Grays were one of the best teams in baseball history. They had a lot of uh, playoff appearances and things like that. You come back on another day and watch the Senators, the white team play in that same time period. They're one of the worst baseball teams in history. And you can be a fan that goes watch the Grays on Sunday and see good players come back on Tuesday and watch the Senators and wonder what you're watching. Well, I saw these guys on Sunday who could help our team. Why can't they be on our team with the, the Senators? Uh, well, because they're black. And, and, and then all these strict restrictions didn't make sense to a lot of people. And the war and there were a lot of other political things that were happening at the same time. And this is when we meet a young man named Jack Robinson. You may know him as Jackie Robinson. Uh, Mr. Robinson was born in Cairo, Georgia. All right. And the family, uh, um, through the Great Migration, moved all the way across country to Pasadena, California. Um, and I know those who will be watching in L.A. know about John Muir High School, uh, where he and his brother attended. His brother, Mac Robinson, uh, was an outstanding Olympic level athlete. Uh, who actually competed in the 1936 Olympics for the United States in track and field. A uh, young Jackie came along and broke all his brother's high school uh, track and field records, but went to Pasadena Junior College where he played multiple sports, including baseball. You see the bottom photo there. Uh, he transferred to University of California, Los Angeles or UCLA, where he did track and field. He played baseball. He played basketball. That's him in the middle in the top photo. Football, number 28, love those leather helmets. Imagine uh, your favorite football team wearing those leather helmets today. Um, he could have probably played in the early NFL because um, uh, these other teammates, Willie Strode and Kenny Washington, who were with him, actually became two of the first black players to play in the National Football League. So he's good looking, he's talented, he can do every sport. Um, uh, but we're in the middle of a war, so he gets drafted into the United States Army in the early 1940s. Actually stationed near here in, in Kansas City at Fort Riley, Kansas, which is the 1st Infantry. Um, ultimately gets transferred to Texas because he becomes an officer, which was a bit of a struggle because they didn't want black soldiers to become officers. But he was able to be successful um, and then got into some trouble in Texas with uh, the military police um, and... Um, because he was fighting for his rights. They wanted him to move to the back of a bus and he didn't want to do that, so like Rosa Parks. He didn't want to do that. And so he got in trouble with the military police, but he didn't get in, in jail or anything like that. But he did get his release from the army and he wanted to, um, wanted to get a job. Uh, and who's hiring at that time? Well, black baseball teams, because they had lost a number of players to the war. And he joins the Kansas City team, the Monarchs. On the left is his teammate, famous Leroy Satchel Page, uh, who is a great uh, pitcher in the Negro Leagues and Negro Leagues history. So he plays with the Monarchs in the 1945 season, does very well. And at the same time, uh, the white baseball teams begin to uh, look at recruiting black baseball players. And that's when the Brooklyn Dodgers discover him and uh, sign him to a minor league contract. And ultimately, he becomes the first black player since um, the early years uh, of the 1800s that I mentioned earlier to play Major League Baseball. Uh, we have a new section in the museum that talks about Jackie Robinson and those players that came after him. Uh, and it's called the Barrier Breakers uh, from Jackie to Pumpsy, 1947-1959. So who is Pumpsy, you might ask? Well, that's the other picture of the gentleman there, Elijah Pumpsy Green from Oakland, California. And he was the, the first African-American to play for the Boston Red Sox team, uh, which in the Boston Red Sox were the last team to have a black or Latino player. Because it takes from 1947 to 1959 before every team gets at least one black or Latino player on their roster. And that's what this section talks about. And uh, we have uh, photos and artifacts related to those first players uh, in this time period. So when you come to the museum, you can find out who the first player was for all the major league teams of that time, um, which were about 16 to 18 teams. Then we have 30 now, but it wasn't quite so many back then. 
But this meant that there was a, a talent being drained from the Negro Leagues, and the Negro Leagues were trying to keep their fans uh, coming to games. They tried something, including uh, having women play with the men in the Negro Leagues. And these were three of the important women who actually got to play on the field with the men in the Negro Leagues in the 1950s. The first on the left there is is, uh, Tony Stone, uh, who grew up in San Francisco. She's from Minnesota. Um, And she was the first player. You may have heard of her. In the middle was Connie Morgan. She was an infielder as well, uh, playing with the Clowns in 1950. uh, Stone was 53, 52, excuse me. And uh, Morgan was like 53. And then on the far end is Mamie Peanut Johnson. And she was a pitcher and was a teammate of Connie Morgan's at the time. And we have a new exhibit on the women uh, and when they played, and well as some women owners who were part of the Negro Leagues. But having the women play, unfortunately, wasn't enough to keep fans coming out to black baseball games. And uh, the Negro Leagues uh, began to go out of business uh, by 1960. But we recognize them here at the museum. This is a special locker section uh, that is that honors um, those Hall of Fame inductees in the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. We have replica uniforms and copies of their placards uh, that hang in Cooperstown. The real ones are bronze in Cooperstown. Uh, and we have, uh, so there, there are players as well as officials who are part of that uh, being honored. And we have this uniform wall. These, are, these aren't real uniforms. These are copies or replicas of uniforms from the Negro Leagues. No, take note of the colors and the different styles that these teams had. They were very colorful, very unique uniforms, the caps and hats that you can see. And this is just a small sample of all the different ones over the years because teams often change their uniforms. But we've made our way back to the Field of Legends. This statue is of Martin DeHigo, who is one of the great Cuban players from the Negro Leagues. He, he's born in Cuba and played in the United States and played all over in Mexico and other places as well. We added an umpire to our statues as well. That is Bob Motley, who uh, was a Negro League umpire in the 1950s. Uh, and now you've made your way back to the Field of Legends. Uh, you can go out through the gift shop and buy as many caps, T-shirts, and books, especially kids, uh, that you want that you can learn about the history of the Negro Leagues. All right. So that ends our tour of the museum. Um We are happy now to uh, talk to you about other things or take questions that you might have from the chat or anything else uh, going on. But we do want to encourage you to come and visit the museum whenever you can. Uh, We are open uh, with some abbreviated hours, uh, but we're open now and have been open since June. Uh, And um, uh, there are lots of things that are coming up as far as traveling exhibits as well. Uh, If you're in the Denver area, we'll have our art exhibit up during the uh, All-Star Week uh, uh, in Denver. And there may be some other exhibits that are happening around the country. So I'm happy to take any questions in the chat or or from Darren or anyone uh, as we've gone through the museum. That was excellent. It was really, really cool to to hear, uh, you know, the history and all of those amazing uh, areas within the museum itself and uh, really excited to get back to Kansas City to check out the uh, new exhibit that you guys have. So very, very cool stuff uh, for, for those students that are looking for some additional resources. Uh, where could they go and find that uh, to continue their education about the Negro League Museum? So there are some websites that you can look at. Um, one, our website is, um, nlbm.com and I might be able to actually put it up another slide that can help us with some of the website. I guess it depends on how deep you really want to go, um, into the history. I can tell you that, um, um, if you go to, we have a YouTube channel as well, um, and, uh, on Facebook where we do a lot of our, programs like this um, uh, with authors and other researchers, as well as just some general uh, programming um, that we do. So you can go to our YouTube channel um, and and see some of that. Let me, uh, I'm going to share my screen one more time so you can see some of the websites uh, that we have. So 
So um, how, how deep do you want to go? The seamheads.com site, and that seamheads.com has some of the statistical data that people may be interested in and learn about players and their baseball stats from the Negro Leagues. Now, it's important to note that Negro League statistics aren't really complete. It's, uh, I mean, again, they didn't have the same level of records that were being kept um, um, like Major League Baseball, but there are a lot of people who've been working very hard to try to piece all that together. And most of that data ends up on the Seamheads Negro League database site. So you can go there at seamheads.com. You can take it a step further with baseballreference.com where they are, because some of the ball players played in the Negro Leagues, they played minor league baseball and they played major league baseball. So you get the full record of some players at baseballreference.com and they have recently added many more Negro League stats. Perhaps the best place to go, and this is a long uh, URL here, but if you just go to the Baseball Hall of Fame site, baseballhall.org, their Negro League site uh, pages are very good about the players who have been inducted there. Um, really good short uh, bios, and including short films, and you get to know who these players are, who are the, the considered the best players and managers from the Negro Leagues. It's a good place to start with the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Go even deeper with retrosheet.org. Uh, they are beginning to add Negro Leagues things, but just baseball in general, it's a great research site. If you actually want to go back to a game and know day-to-day -day, uh, the, the play-by-play -play of what happened in that game, going all the way back to the early 1900s, uh, they have some of that, that information. Uh, I use that site to research Jackie Robinson. Uh, you can go back and look at uh, the box scores and the, and the gameplay of some of Jackie Robinson's games, especially when he stole home. That was something that I researched a lot. So I mean, you guys are young, um, but if you've gone to a baseball game, even if you remember a game that you went to and you were five or six years old, you could probably go to retrosheet.org and maybe you didn't remember something that happened. I thought this happened during the game. Of course, you can go to the MLB.com sites now, uh, but you can go back to retrosheet and find the play-by-play -play of those games. Or maybe ask your parents or grandparents or aunts and uncles about a famous game that they they went through, uh, and you can go back and look it up that way. And one more slide I want to show you, and these are the, 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 the sites that are specifically related to the museum. Um, NLBM.com is our website, so there are a few resources there. I mentioned the YouTube channel. That's our YouTube channel link, which is uh, youtube.com slash NLBMuseum. Uh, and that'll have videos of different things. In fact, our friends at Science and Sports helped us with a really great program on how to learn how to keep score, baseball score. And that is recorded there. And so you can see Darren and, and others helping with understanding how to keep baseball score uh, on the YouTube channel there, as well as some other historical interviews and things like that. We even have some of the inter a few snippets of interviews with baseball players that you can access through the YouTube. We have what we call our e-museum for teachers, and kids can use that too. Uh, now, that I'm, I should tell you that at some point that site is going to be completely revamped, but you can still find most of the, your information there if you're doing papers or special projects with biographies of baseball players uh, there. We are on Facebook, and again, a lot of our virtual programs are on Facebook Live. Uh, and for those of you who use Twitter, our president, Bob Kendrick, uh, does a lot of tweeting for the museum, and then we have our own Twitter uh, handle as well. So that's 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 awesome, Ray. And can you go back to the the slide that you're on prior? Because uh, one of the things that we're really focusing on within this camp is uh, batting average, and to be yes. able to use baseball reference or seam heads uh, is is a really cool. Uh, and this is more of a recent addition to add the data from the Negro Leagues. Um, and so I just want to point that out as uh, some of the things that we're working on within this summer is batting averages. So to be able to look, go back and compare uh, some of the players from the Negro Leagues and maybe you compare those to uh, your favorite player now. Um, so just wanted to, to point out a, a fun activity that we can do to uh, use these references uh, and links to be able to continue that education. 
Um, so that's one of the things that we're working on this week within our camps. And another is really stadium design. So mm. are there current stadiums that are still uh, throughout the country that um, individuals, students, families can go check out? That are related to the Negro Leagues? Yes. So um, there are only a handful that remain, and then, but there are a lot of efforts to try to preserve the sites of those stadiums. So it's important to note, again, that Black teams generally, for the most part, rented their own rented stadiums from the Major League and Minor League teams in their communities. A lot of those stadiums have gone away. I think the only one that is actually still standing in full uh, is Rickwood Field in Birmingham, Alabama. And that was owned and managed by the uh, Birmingham Barons baseball team, which was a white baseball team. Uh, and uh, they have since they have a new baseball stadium now, but Rickwood is now a kind of a museum. Uh, you can still play baseball there. It's just old from the standpoint of facilities and stands, but it still stands as a museum. And the Birmingham Black Barons, the black baseball team, rented that stadium uh, often for their games. So uh, that is the only whole stadium that's still standing. There are other sites that people are commemorating uh, in New Jersey. There's a Hinchcliffe Stadium. Uh, it's standing, but in pretty bad shape, but it had multiple uses for the community. It was a football field, it was a track field, but they did play Negro League games there. But there's been a huge effort to preserve and rebuild that to become more of a, a giant park and community center. And they've had very good success. So you should see some movement on that in Patterson, New Jersey. Hamtramck, Michigan, which is actually a city within the walls of Detroit, which is kind of weird, but it is a separate city. And they have a stadium there that black teams use. And there again, there's a big effort to try to preserve that history there. Uh, so uh, I don't think the whole stadium is still there at Hamtramck, but um, uh, a lot of it still is. And, and again, they've been able to successfully try to uh, um, raise money to, to uh, host the site. Um, there were a couple of teams, black teams, that did own their own ballparks. I wouldn't say that they were uh, expertly designed in the way that architects design stadiums today, and that would be Martin Stadium in Memphis and um, um, Greenlee Field in Pittsburgh, but both are long gone and have been torn down. Uh, uh, so there are no there are very few other stadiums or ballparks that exist, but there are plenty of fields and locations that people are even now discovering that Negro League teams either played or practice on, and the communities are trying to support uh, having those stadiums and or stadium markers. And one final thing, um, just recently, uh, I was able to go down to St. Louis, uh, where the Cardinals uh, helped rebuild a ballpark for Harris Stowe State College, which is a black college uh, near downtown St. Louis. But the, their ball, their uh, campus is on the site of where the St. Louis Stars Negro Leagues team used to play. So they built a new baseball and softball field for the college team and named it Stars Park in honor of the Negro Leagues. Great. Um one thing I just wanted to, to to mention as we talk about stadiums, one of the one of the projects we have been working on uh, in Compton is with the Dodgers Foundation, and there uh, is a park there that's called Gonzalez Park, and that's where Jackie Robinson Stadium is. And mm -hmm. the Dodgers Foundation do an amazing job on going around and refurbishing fields, and uh, this specific project. Uh, we worked on with them to really infuse STEM throughout those grounds. And we were able to use some of Jackie Robinson's examples, his batting average. We talked about how much of an incredible athlete he was in college. They can go see uh, how far they can do their broad jump, uh, mm. their wingspan compared to Jackie Robinson. So uh, that's a really cool initiative. I just wanted to, to mention uh, for those that are watching, uh, and then that are in Los Angeles uh, to kind of continue the education, but also to reiterate that uh, really active learning uh, element throughout this facility. So uh, we do we do have a question I wanted to throw up. Uh, it looks like it's from Mr. Green, and he wants to know what is the average age of the players playing in that league? 
Well, no one's really done a good study on the true number of the average age of the player. I do think, though, it's fair to say that most black teams wanted to make sure that the players were over 18, uh, generally in their early 20s. Um, and most of the time, those players were unmarried. They hadn't started families yet, although some of them did. Um, and But you did have rare exceptions when the talent was good. You occasionally would get a high school age player coming in uh, because their talent was so good and they got permission from their parents uh, to, if nothing else, play in home games, if not uh, away games. The, the, the glaring, the biggest example of that is Roy Campanella. Uh, who uh, at age 15 got his start in the Negro Leagues, 15, 16, playing catcher for the Baltimore Eli Giants. He's from Philadelphia. Um, and so he had been playing many years in the Negro Leagues before he actually got his call up and recruitment to the major leagues in 1946, 48 uh, with the Brooklyn Dodgers and became an, an all-star, uh, three-time most valuable player as well in Major League Baseball. Uh, but by comparison, uh, just Jackie Robinson, for example, this wouldn't be a good example of an average age player, but Robinson was 26 years old when he started playing with the Monarchs and closer to 28 when he got a chance to play with the Dodgers. So by most rookie standards, he's actually kind of old, for lack of a better word. Uh, but um, he... Um, um, was still very talented, as I said, multi-sport athlete. Um, and some would say baseball was his worst sport. He was better at those others. Uh, but um, he excelled. And and on top of that, he played a really high level of baseball with kind of a bum ankle, which he got from football. Uh, he never – he had an ankle that always was chronically giving him problems, and he hurt his ankle playing football. But – even with that, he was still one of the fastest people uh, in Major League Baseball in the time he, he came into the game. So uh, that just shows you just uh, his raw athleticism, his talent, and his, uh, his intelligence as a baseball player. Incredible. And uh, what advice maybe that you would give or uh, maybe there's some – uh, recordings or some athletes uh, that have been able to share their story now um, about you know, becoming a professional athlete or uh, overcoming adversity. Uh, are there any stories um, or advice that you would give yourself to these students that are uh, participating and, and watching uh, along with in this? Oh, well, that's a good question. Uh, well, let me just first say that from the standpoint of Negro Leagues on that YouTube channel, you might find some interesting thoughts from the ball players, uh, the old ball players of some of the things they had to go through. I think it's important to note, uh, you know, uh, I think there's an assumption, too, with history that especially with baseball, that everybody must have loved baseball and wanted to play it. Uh, and for the Negro League players, I can't say that they all – they certainly loved the game. They had to love it to kind of play under the conditions that they played under, uh, considering all the other negative things that were happening to them. Uh, but I, I think it's fair to say, and having had a chance to interview a number of them, that baseball wasn't always their first choice. Uh, but they they understood the times, they dealt with it, uh, and they played the game and they loved the game. And so, I think it. I think understanding their passion is something that it would be very important for young ball players to understand, especially if you're not seeing others like yourself there. You, This game is in our blood. It's, it's part of our tradition of being American, uh, for African-Americans and Latinos especially. Um, uh, we were owners in the game. We, we were innovators in the game. And, and maybe we don't see as many of us on the field today, but um, we were there. We were there from the, almost the beginning. And so this game is yours and you should be proud of it and want to play it. And I think, in my opinion, it's the best game ever. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't need to apologize to football or basketball or anything else. I, I love baseball and what it does for me, just enjoying watching it uh, and playing it. So have a passion for it. Be focused with it. Um, be intentional in what you do uh, when you're practicing. 
uh, and I'm, I'm kind of an amateur musician myself, uh, play a little saxophone, but practice in particular, you practice to, to get your muscle memory and everything else so that when you get a chance to perform, you just know what to do. It just happens. Um, and you're prepared for any situation. So be intentional on what you do, have fun, but work hard at it and, and be serious about it uh, when you can. Um, uh, and hopefully you can maintain that passion um, uh, throughout, but you don't have to be baseball 24 uh, seven, have other interests, um, uh, be willing to learn, be willing to be coachable, um, uh, be willing to learn other things about life and everything else. And science in particular is going to help you uh, expand your, your knowledge base, but also help you in, in what you do with baseball. Just being open to learning uh, will open you up to not just uh, a better personal life, but also being a better ball player. That's excellent. Yeah, we, uh, we love that message. You know, within our programs, we push a lot of growth mindset. And uh, that's a, you know, really kind of being okay to fail, putting yourself out there mm. and, and knowing that it's going to lead you to that success. And, uh, you know, this is a cool opportunity and it's all about exposure. You, you don't know what you don't know. And so we love to be able right. to learn from you and learn about the Negro League Museum. Uh, lastly, I'll, I'll just throw up uh, another question. And I, and I think it's pretty cool because uh, it's something you guys can all do now. Uh, you know, there are many different uh, students that are participating in it from different parts of the, the country. And so uh, you might not be in Kansas City, but we would love to see how far it is uh, from you to do a little road trip. And maybe there's some math uh, uh, tied in there, um, you know, how, how far it is away from where you live, um, how much gas you're going to need, what car you're going to take, all that kind of fun stuff. So we'll leave you with that. And uh, again, thank you so much. Ray, and uh, we really appreciate uh, you joining and, and thank you everyone uh, who tuned in on it. Well, thank you. And we look forward to seeing you all here in Kansas City. Love it. Thanks, Ray. That's it for uh, today's virtual field trip. And thanks for joining. Have a good day. All right.